Welcome to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast. Welcome to the Journal of Biophilic Design. Uh, today, our theme is welcoming nature into our hearts and homes. With our countryside fast vanishing under concrete, um, there's much we can do to mitigate the loss by placing the natural world at the heart of development and planning. The Wildlife Trust say housing developments and houses themselves should be designed to provide space for, for both wildlife and people. But how do we get to this mindset? Well, we're really, really thrilled today to be joined by Chris Packham. Um, he's a naturalist, television presenter, writer, photographer, conservationist, campaigner and filmmaker um, and a very much uh, respected presenter of BBC's BAFTA award winning Spring Watch, Autumn Watch and Winter Watch. So many thanks for joining us today, Chris. Pleasure. A pleasure. Lovely. And um, we're also joined by um, environmental writer uh, Hartley Milner. Um, he's been he's had a passion for nature since he was wee, wee big um, and he's, he's slightly older than both of us. So uh, welcome, Hartley. Uh, yes, slightly. <coughs> <laughs> Lovely. Well, um, I've, I just want to say there's, there's, there's an issue that I feel um, that I've been really strongly about, I feel really strongly about for quite a while, that all these new build developments, um, they're going up around the country, they're ripping up our countryside, they're tearing into our uh, green belt and tearing up the forests and, and more. I mean, what, what are your fears, Chris, uh, with all this happening? What are your fears for the wildlife that we share our world with? Well, in order to share that world with wildlife, we, we need to love it and have an affinity for it. And therefore, you know, we are in a position at the moment where whether we like it or not, uh, we have to put people first or at least alongside that wildlife. Um, and therefore, people need homes. Um, the population of our country um, has been increasing um, and the way that people live their course, the course of their life means that they they need more homes and they move more regularly. And as we know, we live in one of only two countries in the world where, you know, more land is owned by less people than anywhere else. Um, so land is extraordinarily expensive. This means that houses are extraordinarily expensive, which means that it's very difficult for young people in particular to get on the housing ladder. And it's very difficult for many people to live in areas where they work because the houses cost too much all of which is unsatisfactory, of course, because what we're interested in is human communities as much as natural communities. And if we have a healthy human community, then I think that we can ask them to live in a healthy, natural community. And we have the aptitude to sculpt that around those human communities too. So there's no doubt we need housing. There's no question of that. But what we need is affordable, good quality housing in the right place for wildlife and for people. And I do tend to think that some of the lessons of the you know post-war period haven't been learned where you know we put housing where there isn't the infrastructure to support the population that lives there there aren't the shops there isn't the public transport there isn't the access to education um, and and health uh, and so forth um, not without the dreaded motor vehicle um, and and this puts a dependence on people for for travel and we know that's something that we want to to cut down on if we could all cycle to school and to work and and to see our friends it would be a a, a better place to be mm -hmm. so the frustrating thing i suppose from my point of view is that i still see developments going forward where they're in the wrong place uh, the bigger picture isn't being looked at to, uh, look you know, picture being looked at, a sort of short termism going on. And what's the actual fabric of the buildings? It's astonishing that we're still building houses in a way that we did years ago when we know how to make them in a, a far more sustainable um, way um, and a, far, a way which allows them to be far more compatible with the, the natural world. I mean, why isn't it mandatory to have grey water systems in every new build? Why is to have swift bricks in every new build. They cost nothing more than a normal brick. Um, and I think that, you know, what we've done is we've offered opportunities to developers. Um, and of course, when they're keen, they take them. But very sadly, it, it seems that the majority are not keen to suddenly be aware of swift bricks and how well they work and what an enormous advantage they are to these remarkable birds that fly, you know, around the world and come and visit us in the our spring and summer to breed. Um, 
so it, we need to change legislation, I think. Um, and you mentioned green belts. I mean, green belts were put there for a reason, and that was public health. You know, it allowed people to cycle, uh, walk their dogs, play football, go bird watching, whatever it happened that, that they needed to do in, in and close to their community. Uh, they ringed the cities to support, stop that appalling sprawl that we see in many other parts of the world. I mean, when you fly over Mexico City, Los Angeles, Caracas, I mean, I could go on. Um, they don't have the, the municipal parks that we're lucky enough to have in the UK in those cities, and they don't have any green belt, and they just stretch from horizon to horizon, and there's no hope for any of those people living in them to get any sensible access to nature. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's something that needs addressing. And as you can tell, I've already sort of, there's a minor rant going on. Um, and minor rant is, is motivated by the fact that if we didn't have solutions to these problems, then it would be easier to live with. But when we've got a raft of solutions to these problems and they're effectively on the shelf and we're not, in, you know, we're not implementing them, then at this time, you know, people like myself are going to get ranty. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely i completely I, I, I totally agree with you i just one of the things about the green belt and all the green and all the green land that's there I, i'm always you know i'm really passionate about the equity as well so people that can't afford to have to have like a big garden because they can't like you just mentioned the land is so expensive at least they can get out and go to the green belt they can go out but you know you start stripping that away that means that you know you only get green for for those with money um yeah with more division and what was interesting was that during lockdown, there was a number of studies done because people were, as you know, um, accessing nature and finding the, or refinding the benefits of that and then becoming very enthusiastic about it. Um, so the Office for National Statistics looked at uh, London mm. and they looked at who had gardens or who had access to green space. And what they found was that black people living in London had less gardens and they had less access to green space. So that equality that you speak of, um, in that case, it was a racial inequality, but of course, there are lots of other economic inequalities as well. Mm -hmm. um, and often, you know, the green space is there, but it's not accessible to those communities. We've not made it accessible to those communities, it's not welcoming to them. And therefore, they don't and haven't uh, taken advantage of it. And all of these things have to be addressed. Without equality, we're not going to solve any of our problems. You know, that, that, that's the bottom line. Yeah. Um, and we really need to uh, address that most forthrightly and as rapidly as possible. Can I ask you, just ask you about the um, uh, government's consultation on biodiversity net gain proposals? Um, I assume you're okay with those? I am indeed, yeah. I mean, that's yeah. one of the things that we've I been... I mean, it all sounds very good on paper, uh, protecting existing habitats and ensuring developments uh, impacts on biodiversity are compensated for. Uh, you know, and including Swiftwicks and uh, uh, bee hotels and the like. Um, do you think the, uh, and there's got also there's uh, plans for a, an enforcement body to make, obviously to make sure that these uh, measures are enacted. But, I mean, is all that enough or, I mean, the, the aim is to create, deliver a 10% boosting uh, an area's biodiversity. I mean, is that feasible? Um, I think it's feasible. Under this it's, it's, whether, it's whether it's realistic using the governance that we've got and the legislation that's being drafted. Yeah. And I'm skeptical about that. Um, one of the things that we can immediately look at is that in the government's uh, assessment of what it describes as protected land in the UK and has set targets for a certain percentage of that land to be set aside for nature. It includes our national parks. And what we know is that our national parks largely are not fit for purpose when it comes to, you know, public goods for public money. Um, they're not as protected as they should be. Um, some of the national parks in the north of England and Scotland are regularly burned, um, which is you know, damaging in terms of climate change and biodiversity, so on and so forth. I'm speaking to you from the, the new forest here, which is completely overgrazed. Um, there are more flowers growing in my relatively small garden than you'll find growing in the surrounding probably five kilometres, uh, square kilometres of the national park outside it. 
Um, so, you know, we've not managed those national parks in a way which is um, beneficial for wildlife and therefore not beneficial for people either. So as much as we visit them and we see them as green utopias, that, you know, that's something which, again, we, we've We've, we've misinformed people, you know, it, it may well be green, but that doesn't make it a pleasant land. And, and many of those landscapes in the national parks are highly modified and they're very species poor and they could be delivering a lot more species and a lot more public good. Mm -hmm. So the idea that we include those large areas in that, um, you know, that figure that the government want to, to brandish about protected areas is entirely fallacious. Um, and, and again, I think that you know, there are a lot of well-meaning people who work very hard to get this legislation through. But the problem is um, that there are too many lobbyists from collectives of people who either want things to go in a different direction or they want things to stay the same. Mm -hmm. And by the time that that legislation gets anywhere near um, needing to be meaningful, it's been radically diluted and it's not really what we what we need. Mm -hmm. And what we need is a sea change, a collective sea change in political attitude um, where, where our, those that are governing us recognise the immediate and urgent need to address these issues. Because frankly, and, and you as an environmental correspondent will know, the, these sorts of conversations, we've been having them for years and years and years, mm -hmm. and nothing or very little has changed. And now we're at a point where we put it off so long that if it doesn't change very rapidly, then we're in very, very deep trouble. And so I suppose ultimately your question, you know, was asking, do I trust the government to draft legislation which will protect the natural environment for the foreseeable future? And the answer is no. No. Well, <clears throat> go along with what you're saying there. It's, um, it's all very worrying. Uh, but... Uh, you could say, I suppose, that at least some um, action is being taken uh, in relation to new housing developments, uh, and you know it's better than nothing. Um, whether the legislation there in the Environment Act is strong enough or not, uh, how how can we tell unless we we try? Um, it's not only about having legislation, though. It's about implementing it and policing it, isn't it? That's well, yeah, and that's what I was going to bring you to the point about the, there's a body that has been set up um, to enforce the regulations that are coming under the buy net, net game proposals. Um, but what sort of but the people like the Wildlife Trust uh, say that it's just simply inadequate, it doesn't have the teeth uh, that a good watchdog needs. Um, I mean, is this going to just be uh, another, um, you, you know, another piece of government spin, or is it, is it actually going to, to make a, a, an impact in the long term? It has been widely criticised by uh, uh, groups such as such as the RSPB. I think they're right. I I, I don't think it's got the teeth. I don't think we've got the people in place with any teeth or any interest in, in doing this. We, we, we are currently responsible for the conference of parties. We had one in November. It was significantly one of the most exciting in some ways and chronically depressing in others um, event that I've ever been to in my life. You know, I saw an extraordinary number of highly motivated, inspirational, able people who, mm -hmm. given the opportunity, would be able to do great things for this world. And mm -hmm. I walked from that room into another where I saw a, a collective bunch of ignorant short termists with nothing other than greed in mind who wanted to keep things exactly as they were. And the fact that they'd allowed 500 fossil fuel lobbyists into the event really speaks volumes as what chances of success it might have had. Yeah. None of these people care uh, enough about our future and about the world around them. Um, and, and as a consequence of that, we find ourselves in dire straits. Mm -hmm. And, and I, my, my, my torrid and sad prediction is that, Unfortunately, it's going to have to hurt us a lot more than it is currently doing so before they see a benefit of, of, of dealing with the issue because that's when we'll start voting for them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm, you know, like so many other people, 
you know, I'm completely disenchanted with contemporary politics, particularly mm. in the UK, but that's not going to come as any surprise to, to anyone. Yeah, I imagine you'd like, like to have uh, stood up and, and asked these people a, a very basic question. How much do you love your children? Mm. Yeah. Well, we're killing our children and we're killing our grandchildren at the moment. And, and, and there's no other way of, of phrasing it. And, and we're doing it flagrantly. And, and what we've seen in the last few weeks is BP and Shell posting colossal profits whilst people in the UK are going cold because they can't afford to pay their heating bills. And when we're talking about colossal profits, we're, we're talking also about colossal amounts of fossil fuels being used and, and our government still sanctioning the further exploitation, exploration for further exploitation of yet more fossil fuels. Yeah. And when we get an energy crisis, these people reach for the again the short-term solution let's go back to fracking oh. frankly we should have been investing in renewables with with gusto for years and we should have stopped subsidizing fossil fuel exploit uh, exploration and exploitation and we should be making sure that these pop these people pay considerable sums of that ghastly profit they're making back into the public purse yeah absolutely i just i, I wish i wish they did i wish we could get hold of them and 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 nail them to something so that they won't do this the, the fracking thing i mean there's no so many people have stood up and said no um but there's too much money at stake here isn't there like you said the fossil fuel um side of things it's just uh yeah it's 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 not fair it's not fair actually because we don't you know we, we try we're all doing our little thing we're all doing our little bit to try and lobby people and and try and get a policy change but i, I don't know what's going to cause a policy change to be fair um, I think I think it will be pain, unfortunately. I mean, yeah. that's the trouble. You know, when our back garden is on fire, when yeah. our back garden is underwater, when yeah. our supermarkets are full of food that we can't afford to buy because yeah. of world food shortages, when we are running short of water, then mm -hmm. then we will act because the human species is remarkably intelligent, adaptable and resourceful. And we, we can solve problems. We solved a problem with the disease by coming up with a vaccine, not completely very sadly, but, but we came up with a vaccine in about eight months. We're yeah. brilliant at cure. We're no good at prevention. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence of that, it's a sad indictment of our collective intellect that we have to wait to fall over before we pick ourselves up. But I think that's what's going to have to happen at the moment, because these people that we've elected at the moment have no intention of moving in the right direction with as much fortitude as they need to do at this critical time. And that's very plain to see. Mm. You know, they're using every distraction tactic that they possibly can to keep our eyes off of the bigger picture. And the bigger picture is that our planet is on fire. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Um, sort of one, one of the reasons that I set up the, this Journal of Biophilic Design was really to try and get into, um, just try and encourage architects, um, interior designers, town planners, city planners as well, because obviously there's biophilic cities, um, that the whole, I suppose, biophilic design movement is really trying to um, encourage those people in the built environment to, to, to build with nature in mind. Obviously, biophilic design is not is about bringing real, real elements of nature in, so real trees, real plants and that, but it's also about patterns of nature, natural light, for instance, you know, so then we need less energy and all this sort of stuff, um, more um, uh, natural airflow and everything. Um, I mean, uh, do you think, um, do you think that if people are surrounded by um, in their day to day life. So I'm talking about, you know, people in office blocks, you know, people in, in who work in um, in the decision making places as well. If they're surrounded by nature, if they're surrounded by biophilic design, that they that that, that will um, help change their mind. So if we can if we can bring physically to the people with design. So because this is aimed at mostly at designers and, and people. Um, if they can bring more nature into the built environment, into offices and, and spaces, do you think that will help um, encourage people to a, live more sustainably, uh, but also whatever their job they're doing, that will help them make more um, critical uh, choices that are better for, for, for wildlife, uh, people and planet? Well, if they're not in contact with it, how can they ever learn to love it? How can mm. they ever recognise the, 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 the true value of it? Um, in their lives and for their lives and for its lives. Um, so that that one to one contact with nature, you know, it, it is absolutely essential. And again, 
going back to lockdown, that's what we saw. We saw people, uh, you know, looking at things that they'd previously only seen. We saw people listening to things they'd previously only heard because they had that time to stop and engage. And when they did, they were overjoyed. And the benefits that it brought to their house, you know, their health in that really stressful um, uh, time was, was profound. Mm. But I mean, I think again, you know, so on the, the building here has a green roof on it. Okay, mm -hmm. it's got a green meadow on it. Um, and the house that I've, I've got, I'm, I've, I've been investigating only last night uh, with someone else who has a similar interest in, in, in living walls. So part of it is wood and part of it is concrete, I suppose. Um, and the concrete bit of it, I'm going to cover with a, a living wall. Mm -hmm. Now, I was looking at the living walls and they're very beautiful and they clearly work and the engineering you know, um, the construction, the irrigation, so on and so forth, it's, it's clearly working. But all of those that I looked at online uh, were planted with species that were clearly easy to manage. Mm -hmm. um, but I wonder what they really offer nature, because none of them I saw the walls I'm talking about, vertical mm -hmm. surfaces, um, were planted with anything that was producing any nectar. So mm -hmm. yes, they were, they were green and they were growing and that's great from the human perspective, but it wasn't maximizing it from, from a biodiversity point of view. Mm -hmm. So rather than have you know, the typical sedum roof on, on here, I've got a, a wildflower meadow growing on the, the roof of this building. Lovely. Because I want nectar as well as, as everything else. And of course there are management issues. I'm gonna have to mow it and I'm gonna have to take the trees out of it and so on and so forth. But it's a relatively small roof and it's in a domestic situation and therefore I, I, I can do that. Um, in my rather small garden, I, I've put up, and I'm gonna have to lose count here. I mean, 30 tip boxes, 10 robin boxes, four tawny owl boxes, uh, six duck boxes, eight back boxes. Now. That's because I've got a really passionate interest in looking after the welfare of these animals and a desire to share my community with them. But all of those things, I shouldn't have had to add to them. They should have already been here when I moved. They should have been built into this environment, you know, as they should for everyone else who doesn't have that very you know, profound and directed interest in, in, in the natural world. Obviously, I'm bound to do that, aren't I? That's my thing. But it isn't everyone's thing until they look up, as I just have at a bird box, which is just behind the screen here, um, with a, a great tip going in and out of it. Yeah. So we have to, we, we have the opportunity to offer people, you know, access to nature, yeah. even in intensely urbanized environments. It improves their health. It improves air quality. It, it you know, we know that ponds in, in, in city centres reduce the temperature. Mm -hmm. It improves the you know, potential for biodiversity, richness of things like that robin singing that you might be able to hear there, which is absolutely joyous. And mm -hmm. robins sing throughout the year, throughout all of our towns and cities. Um, and, you know, so they're not a rare bird. They're not difficult to encourage. We're not, this is not, we're not talking sort of ecological, great tits back, rocket, uh, ecological rocket science here. These are, this is low hanging fruit. But the problem is we need to breed and educate a generation of planners, developers, designers, architects who are au fait with all of these things. And perhaps in order to encourage them, and I, and I, and I prefer carrot to stick on every occasion, but it's gone on for so long, we're running out of time so quickly. I think that some of those things need to be mandatory now. I think that houses ought to be built with bat boxes in them, with swift bricks in them. I think that gardens ought to have fruit trees planted in them. I think they didn't ought to have all of the topsoil stripped out so that you know, the, the soil's absolute rubbish and someone throws down some turf. And then the minute you stick a spade through it, it's a load of old dumped rubbish and, and, and gravel. You know, I think we ought to offer to people the opportunity to, to be able to work with their space um, for a better environment for them and wildlife. And that would be part and parcel of, 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 of all developers remit. Mm -hmm. and, 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 I, and I'm very worried at the moment that what our governments have been doing successively in, in recent times is making it easier for developers to do the wrong thing rather than the right thing when it comes to wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and that's, that, that's, that's, not, that's not great. Yeah. <clears throat> I think you're right. I was gonna. So I was just gonna say about the um, developers need to needing to be educated. Um, it's almost like we need to give them like this. This is like you know, like almost like a fast track or like a like a, a box, <laughs> if you want, with all the bits in to say right. You need a bat box. You need this. You need this. You need this. You need this. It's like a takeaway kit. 
that you then can go and install um, somewhere. I think if it's made really easy, like path of least, least resistance, then they might actually do something. Um, you mentioned um, about living walls. I don't know if I, I interviewed uh, Daniel Bell. Um, he's brilliant. So he's using recycled um, clothing uh, for, for this and he literally just staples them in. And it, it's brilliant. And he uses a real myriad of species. He puts like juniper trees and all kinds of things in it. But I mean, obviously, I'm just saying it might be worth having a conversation with him um, to, to create something because he's very um, he's very much obviously for, for wildlife and everything else. Um, he did the big thing at Piccadilly, um, very approachable, but very, but again, um, is very eco-friendly. So there might be something there. So you talk about that. So just, just as a kind of um, thing, if if people are listening to this and they're in one of these dreaded new builds <laughs> where it's completely stripped, so there's like there's probably like one tree in the whole street or something, and maybe there's a little bush. Um, they've got you know beautiful pristine lawn, um, but it's tiny. What what kind of advice would you give them to kind of to just to to bring well, some nature in? I grew up in a three up three down with a with a back garden that was half the size of a tennis court. Frankly, you know we transformed it in, and. It, but you say, you, you know, those patches are tiny. They are individually, but in terms of that community, they're not. So if the community works together, you know, then, then, then you get a synergistic build. Of course, if only one of those gardens has trees planted in, um, is producing nectar, has put up bird boxes, feeding the birds, it, it would have a minimal impact because it would be an island, a beautiful little oasis in, in an otherwise dead space. But if someone looks over the fence and says, oh, that looks quite interesting. I like your great tip going in and out your box. Kids will love that. I'll put a box up too. And that spreads throughout the community. Then, you know, our gardens, however small, we know that collectively in the UK add up to an area the size of Suffolk and we manage them and within reason we're not told what we can and can't do in them mm -hmm. so you know we don't need to spray them with huge quantities of insecticides mm -hmm. you know we don't need to plant loads of sterile non-natives and we don't need to smother them in plastic grass you know we we are the managers of our potential back garden nature reserves and as I say, in a very, very modest space when I grew up, we had lots of wildlife living there. But then, you know, when I, we looked over into our neighbours, so did they. Mm -hmm. So, again, I think it's enabling people and empowering them to know that as individuals, they can make a difference. And as communities, they can make a bigger difference. And then collectively, we can all make that very significant difference, which will see the changes that we need so that we can live and survive more sustainably on, on, on this planet. There's no doubt about that. Mm. But we have to be very clear here because I do visit developments where brilliant things have been done for nature. They've got ponds, they've got native species, they've got hedgerows, they do have bird boxes and bat boxes, they've got everything. It's really well done. But this doesn't necessarily mean that those houses are, you know, mid-range or expensive. This can be done in any type of housing, any type of development. Mm. You know, and particularly, obviously, it's more important in inner city and urban environments that we concentrate even more on this than we might in, you know, like a rural location uh, where, where I'm living now. So, mm. you know, again, focusing our efforts where it's most needed, Im implementing all of the tools that we already have tried and tested in our toolkit. We know they work. Mm. You know, it should be something that we that we must act upon not should or might or could but must act upon uh, now mm. uh, so I, <coughs> in Hertfordshire where I live there's uh, massive developments going on all over the place um, and um, some of them um, there's was one in um, Aylesbury that's particularly particularly good it has all the all the f things you were talking about swift um, bricks and, um, and various nooks and crannies for other uh, creatures. I mean, it's got uh, places for other birds and also bees and, and so forth. And it's, um, on the face of it, it, it looks as though it, it's helping to provide a solution in that particular area. Um, but, you know, these are, uh, is that just tokenism or, or, or is it, really going to have an effect i mean will the I, birds I, actually use it i think they will locally but of course you know we we, we know that you know 86 percent of the uk landscape is under forestry or farming 
So when it comes to nature conservation management, we're under 1% of, of, of the UK, because I don't include the national parks, because most of them aren't fit for purpose when it comes to, you know, for, for biodiversity. They offer all sorts of opportunities for, for people to get out into green spaces. That's great. They can walk, they can cycle, they can horse ride, they can, um, you know, but they're not doing it in, in an environment which is in any way rich enough. So they're not in my list, but no, so locally, of course they can, but we need to be doing that far more broadly. You know, we're living in an age of, of rather grotesque industrial agriculture, spraying everything, fertil over fertilizing everything, draining it here, just damaging the stores here, there and everywhere. Um, and as a consequence, you know, our wildlife is, is significantly impoverished in that environment. Now we can try to fix it and we must, and we can moan about it. And, well, you know, that's sometimes therapeutic or, if we are very fortunate enough to have a garden of our own, we can actually do something about it ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if we're moving into a, a new house, then of course people are interested in parking, access to schools, access to shops and other amenities that they require. But we are coming to a point when those people should also be you know, in a position where they can choose to live somewhere which is naturally healthy too. Mm -hmm. So they would have retained trees if there were trees there in the first place, mature trees, which you can't just stick in and, and, and put a post in and, and, and hope will prosper. Um, and they will, you know, as I said before, be able to buy properties if they're fortunate enough to have a garden where, where there is decent soil that they can plant into and where in fact it should have already been, uh, you know, uh, have been planted. I remember visiting Welland Garden City once and, 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 and getting a drone shot of a, uh, a suburban street there. Um, and these, this was post-war housing, one of those new towns. And I, I spoke to some of the original owners and they said that they just moved in and there was a knock at the door and, and someone turned up with two fruit trees for every house. Oh, wow. And they planted them in their garden and we put the drone up and we flew down that street and they were the vast majority of them, these apples, pears, plums, etc., were all still growing in those gardens, offering fruit for people and offering, you know, fruit and flowers for, for wildlife. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we need to go back to. If we, could, if we were doing it in Welland Garden City in the 19, uh, late 1940s, early 50s, we can do it now. Yeah, absolutely. What, what if you obviously because there's loads of architects, there's there's town planners, um, there's you've got, got a kind of like a captive audience here, really, <laughs> um, in sort of in terms of um, how people could um, retrofit um, nature into a design, um, but also if they're planning new things, what would you tell them to do? What would you ask them to do? What would you advise them to do? Or where well, can they also find more I, I, I think it's, it's, it's really simple. I, I was given a, a profound piece of philosophical advice in the early 70s um, by Clint Eastwood. Um, and he said to me, <laughs> a, a man has got to know his limitations. He said it to everyone in, in one of his rather violent movies. A man has got to know his limitations. Now, look, when I was building this thing here, I'm not an architect. I'm not a builder. I don't know about the fabrics, um, how to acquire them, how to mix them and put them together, how to build long, you know, levity into these sorts of things. So what did I do? I went to an architect. I went to builders and I asked them and I listened and I considered their, uh, their advice um, and, and I implemented it. I, frankly, people like myself have a skill set which within the best will in the world, and, I, and listen, I'm not being in any way arrogant or derogatory, that, that architects haven't been trained to have. I'm an ecologist, you're an architect. I need your advice to do this. I'm not being funny, but you need someone like my advice in order to help you deal with the ec ecology. Mm -hmm. Now, there may well be you know, architects and designers out there who do have all of the attributes, but they will obviously be in a relative minority. So please reach out to those people so that when you're doing your development, you don't stick loads of hideous, non-native, crappy cherry trees in with flowers that won't allow bees anywhere near the nectar, that you won't surround supermarket car parks with things which may look green, but offer nothing for than, than the capacity to, to trap litter but beneath the branches. You know, there is so much more that, that we could collectively do if we were working in effective partnerships. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, it really is about, you know, if you've got the will to go in that direction, don't go 60% there and make it green, go 100% there and make it green and fruitful for both people and wildlife. And sometimes I think that, you know, 
it, it's 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 about accepting what you you know my job is all about what i don't know and but i do know who to ask that that's the key thing you know none of us are experts there's always more to learn mm -hmm. and and the best way to learn it is to go to someone else who knows more about it than you do like the architects i spoke to when i put this up i didn't know how to build a green roof i just i know what i wanted on it i wanted nectar on it and they and they delivered yeah. So I think it, it's about working in closer partnership with with ecologists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you've got the, you know, the passion when you've got the energy and the ambition to do something more sustainable and green, then, you know, don't have people like me driving into your car park, looking down your noses at some grotesque Japanese maple that's not going to be doing as much as it could be doing if it was a lovely willow birch or oak that would be visited from the creatures that were already living around the corner. It's sometimes it's very simple things that, you know, just polishing it and, and, and making it work. And, and I think that, you know, trees, you know, we, we, we have this peculiar relationship with trees in the, in the UK. People are convinced that ivy kills them. Oh my God, you know, years of, millions of years of evolution between two types of plant, the tree and the, and, 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 and the ivy. Um, you, 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 nothing wants to kill its, its support mechanism to be quite honest with you uh, you know we've got this thing that roots undermine properties and cause them to fragment and um, we've got all sorts of these antiquated ideas which have all been proven to have been uh, you know i mean i know there's heave you cut a tree down the hand lifts up can damage the wall there are instances but the way that we essentially persecute trees when we when we we produce new developments um, and undervalue them um, in terms of the way that they break up the landscape um, give a perch for a robin to sing um, and to find all of its food um, um, to clean the uh, air of pollutants um, which we know are significant problems in the uk Thirty thousand people a year dying in the uk from air polluted uh, uh, polluted air related conditions um do you know what i mean yeah, trees exactly. you really got to love them and any developer that takes a big tree down unnecessarily i mean in this day and age you've really got to be asking yourself what you're doing frankly trees that's one of the most valuable assets that you're going to have in your development you know a, a nice big tree yeah exactly and also i mean they they've done these all these studies haven't they i mean they've got photos that are floating around these sort of memes and things where you've got like a street and they've got the temperature on like the cars and the and the and the pavements and this kind of thing was like was devoid of trees devoid of greenery and it's really really high they put trees in there and it reduces the temperature i mean that's that's got to be a win-win i mean straight away in a city hasn't it because that's going to reduce their carbon whatnot and all the temperature off gas thing majig you know it's just it's really um Put the put the trees in. and they're so beautiful and there's so much pleasure to go and sit under you know if it can create community spaces as well so it can encourage people to to actually get out and communicate so you, it's good for our mindset it's good for you know mixing and everything well chris um, my final question i ask everybody um at the end of the podcast um and it's a fantasy question and it's like just you know just let your just pour your heart out here if you could paint the world with this magic brush of biophilia what would the world look like? It would be a place where, you know, people and wildlife can can stand a chance of that harmonious coexistence. I mean, we are essentially consuming too much. There are too many of us. Um, we've got into a lifestyle and uh, uh, which is is which is driven by that consumption. Um, and we've forgotten that the very simple things like the robin singing and the blue tick going in the box and the color of those green leaves that I'm, I'm looking at here um, can give us so much reward. Um, and essentially they're, they're, you know, they're free. So I suppose it would be to allow people to have that first hand, to generate a place where people can have that first hand contact with nature, um, where it can surprise them where it can sneak up on them, where they might have gone through the first half of their life without recognizing it, it was there. And then they open their window one morning and a blackbird singing and they think, oh, blimey, what about that then? Um, and I think that that is entirely feasible. I think we could house the population of the UK in a way which was so, so much more healthy for them and, and for wildlife too. And we could build those new houses, but we could build them in a way where, you know, they are, you know, sustainable. We, we do have problems and they're socio-economic problems in the UK. I mentioned that the issue of land ownership and the price of land and the impact that that has on the price of housing, which is, 
you know, disastrous. And we don't see that in other parts of, of the world. We see also all sorts of restrictions when people apply for permission to put up, what should we say, more modern homes, which are far more environmentally friendly in terms of their insulation and water usage and wastage and all those sorts of things. But they don't, they don't fit. We, we, you know, we still like the past too much for me in, in, in the UK, you know. I mean, I like a Tudor house, of course I do, but I don't, I don't, I don't like a mock Tudor house. You know, I, 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 want, I want to live in the modern world and I, I, I want to be in a place where we're using all the technologies and all the understanding and knowledge that we have to the best of our advantage now, you know. Um, so I think we should be a bit more free about, you know, building, you know, contemporary housing. Do you know one thing, I, this is, I might strike you as a sort of a bit naive, but I often drive down, you know, suburban streets and, um, and I'll see, you know, properties there that stretch over hundreds of years of age in, in, in difference. You know, you can see some really old properties, can't you? They go back to sort of 1200s and then through the, mid, you know, the late Middle Ages into, uh, into the, you know, 1600s, 1700s. And do you know what? They, they all look pretty much the same. They've all got like windows and a door and a roof and a path up to the door. And, you know, and you sort of think, do you know what? In the, you know, <laughs> I've got a device here, like in my hand, right? That, that was like, it, that frankly, it's like something off a of Star Trek. And this is what, this was Star Trek in the 1960s, you know? Yes. The world has moved on so much in terms of technology. And yet the way we build our houses is, just hasn't moved on very much in hundreds of years i mean i we use different fabrics and um, you know and 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 they're more comfortable and they're easier to heat um and so on and so forth sometimes but where's the radical thinking that we should be employing where's the radical you know new fabrics that we could be employing you know what well, all of those if we have to have tiles like we had ooh, way back where are those solar tiles? So we don't have to put solar panels up. It's just the tiles are already solar. You know, what, what, what we got about the, what's so great about the past? You know, some of those houses that I drive past, you know, people were dying of plague in them. You know, it wasn't all great. You know, we, we're so gripped by nostalgia. Can't we look forward and build housing that's going to work today and tomorrow? Because frankly, I've lived in an old cottage <laughs> and, and it was a nightmare. You know, it cost us a fortune to heat it. And the minute we turned the heating off, it got cold because there was no insulation. There was no double glazing. We couldn't do anything with it because it was listed. And as much as I loved it and it was charming, it wasn't really suitable for contemporary living. It was like living in a museum <laughs> that you couldn't upgrade. Um, I like museums and I like old houses, but a lot of people can't afford to live in them because I can't afford to just piss money out of the window for the heating, you know. We, so can't we just lighten up with the planning and, and, and start building some really radical new things that are going to work? I don't know, maybe I'm just completely out of line, but I just, I drive down the street and I look at all these old buildings, I thought they all look the same. What's going on? Come on, guys. Thank you for listening to the Journal of Biophilic Design podcast.